and uh, um, I I have been knowing uh, Wayne way 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 back um, since I started my um, research fellowship at Bristol University. Um, so it's it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Wayne Patterson today. So P P Professor uh, Patterson. Um, um, it's, a uh, you know, from the modern East Asian history at St. Norbert's College in Wisconsin. He received his undergraduate degree in history from um, Swarthmore College and two master's degrees and a PhD in history and international relations from the University of um, Pennsylvania. He has been a visiting professor at Harvard University, the um, University of Chicago, the University of uh, Pennsylvania, the University of California at Berkeley, um, Vanderbilt University, the University of um, Kansas, the University of Wisconsin Medicine, the University of South Carolina, and the University of Hawaii. But abroad, he has been a visiting professor at universities in Korea, the Philippines, and Hong Kong. He has held four Fulbright fellowships. He is the author or editor of 16 books, including In the Service of His Korean Majesty, um, William Nelson Lovett, The Pusan Customs, The Final Korean Relations from 1876 to 1888, uh, published um, by University of California, Berkeley in 2012. The Korean Frontiers in America, Immigrations to Hawaii from 1896 to 1910, um, published in 1994. And another example is, uh, is it Yose? You said the first uh, first generation um, Korean immigration to um, to in Hawaii. So uh, from 1903 to 1973, uh, in 2003, the annual meeting of the American Historical Association in Chicago devoted an entire panel to a discussion of his research. So without any delay, let's welcome Professor Patterson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tsai. Uh, it's good to see Professor Tsai again after many years. And um, I'm very grateful to the RAS for inviting me here today. Uh, the book that I'm going to talk about is This one right here, um, I believe it's the next, uh, here it is, uh, William Nelson Lovett in Late Qing, China, and the subtitle, War, Maritime Customs, and Treaty Ports, 1860 to 1904. And in my remarks today, I'm going to uh, spend most of my time on this, but there's a little bit of a previous book which Wei Pin was kind enough to mention, called uh, In the Service of His Korean Majesty, William Nelson Lovett, The Pusan Customs and Sino-Korean Relations, 1876 to 1888. And the reason I do that is because even though this book is mostly about Korea, uh, Sir Robert Hart, who most of you are familiar with, uh, got him fired from his position as Commissioner of Customs in Busan. So we learn a little bit about Sir Robert Hart, the uh, the IG, if you will, of the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs Service. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. This is a map of East Asia, mostly China, and uh, the red dots there are the places, for the most part, where Lovett was posted as a uh, 
mostly a tide surveyor in the Chinese Imperial Maritime Customs Service. Uh, you'll notice that most of them are up and down the Yangtze River uh, with a few exceptions. And so we will try to uh, hit some of the highlights of that. You're probably wondering how this research actually got started. And the answer is that uh, back in 1980, I was leading a student group to China. And uh, I ran into a tourist from the United States, from the state of Nevada, named Lena Sharp. And we were talking, and she found out what I did for a living. She says, oh, I have a box of letters up in my attic from a sea captain who lived in China back in the 19th century. Would you be interested in looking at them? So I said, why, sure. And so a few weeks later, I get this big box of letters, and they were the letters written by this fellow, uh, William Nelson Lovett, mostly to his wife and children, uh, who were for many years back in, uh, back in the United States. You're probably saying, well, wait, uh, he was a British guy, wasn't he? Well, yes, he was. He was born in Southampton in 1838. And this is the street that he was, uh, he lived on. Uh, but these are not the original houses because uh, this area was blown up by the Germans during World War II. So these are reconstituted uh, houses. And um, you all know who this is, of course, uh, my American audience may not know everything about that, but that, of course, is uh, Admiral Nelson, uh, or Russell Crowe, as we say in the United States. And um, you notice a lot of people with red shirts around the base of the uh, obelisk there, uh, because it turned out when I took the picture of the uh, Korean Korean soccer team had just uh, defeated the Turkish in the quarterfinals of the World Cup. So all the Koreans in London showed up. <laughs> in, and the reason they're wearing red shirts is because they are the Red Devils, except that the Christians in Korea didn't think it was a good idea to call their soccer team the Red Devils, so they've changed it to the Taegukki Fighters. Taegukki is the word for the Korean flag. I kind of like Red Devils myself. So here they are with all the all the Korean flags. At any rate, um, it's not clear if William Nelson Lovett is actually uh, related to uh, Sir Nelson, or he was simply named after him. But we do know that he came from a military family, and um, I found the grave of his mom and dad. Uh, and if you've got great eyesight, and let's just see where this works. No. Uh, you'll see that his father was a member of the Royal Fusiliers, and Americans don't know what that means, but that's infantry. And um, so they are born. This is in a section of Southampton called Old Shirley. Old Shirley. So he's from a military family. Uh, his brother, Tom, is on the left. He joined the Navy. Uh, and William Nelson on the right. Uh, he's going to join the British Army. And I went to the public record office uh, to find his enlistment record. Couldn't find it. But we do know that he was 15 years old when he enlisted. And uh, he became, he joined the uh, artillery section of the, of the uh, Royal uh, the British Army. And here's for my, here's another photograph of him at around the same time. Uh, 
Uh, his first uh, duty assignment after his basic training was in India. He was sent to India in uh, 1857 to help put down the Sepoy Rebellion. And as you can see, he got uh, two medals for his service as an artillery person in the uh, British Army. And in 1860, his unit was transferred to China because the Second Opium War was going on at the time. And so his, let's see if I can get this. Um, Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. Um, his, uh, so he sailed from uh, Calcutta to uh, Taku, which is right here on the, on the, Report uh, with a stop in Hong Kong for the first time he sees Chinese people in Hong Kong. So his unit is uh, marching from here uh, up through Tianjin, which is right here, and then up here. And he's going to get as far as here, and that's where they are waiting to breach the walls of China, of the of Beijing. Uh, but the uh, Chinese surrendered just before there's any combat. And um, so his unit is then sent to Shanghai in 1860. So before 1860, he's fighting against the Chinese, against the, in the uh, Opium War. But now he's sent to Shanghai and he's going to end up serving or fighting against the Taiping. And um, in something called the cooperative policy, that means that after 1860, the Qing dynasty is going to be helped by the Westerners, British and the French. Now, you're probably all familiar uh, with uh, Chinese Gordon, uh, Prosper Jekyll, the, the French fellow. Uh, so this is all part of the cooperative policy, and one of them is to fight the Taiping. So uh, here's what Lovett says about the people that they're fighting. Uh, these people, the Taiping, profess to read and carry out the doctrines of the Bible and so deceive other men and nations. But I now think the veil is lifted. Nothing could be more hard to look upon. Numerous dead bodies lying about, some burnt by fire, some starved to death, others with their heads off, show the work of the Long hairs, Chang Mao. That's from uh, his journal. His journal, by the way, is at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Bancroft Library. Uh, so his job in Shanghai is to teach the Chinese soldiers how to fire uh, howitzers. And uh, at one point, uh, Lovett is showing off his artillery, and one of the spectators was the famous Li Hongzhang. And Li Hongzhang made a comment. He said that uh, Lovett's artillery shells, quote, bloomed upon touching the ground. I'll tell you about two of his, uh, two of his campaigns. One was here in Chinese. And I got these from the public records office in Kew Garden. So his unit, his unit is here and they're firing toward the, the wall here in uh, Jading and in Chaolin, his unit Artillery are breaching the walls here in uh, at this engagement against the Taiping. In 1862, the 
He's made it up to sergeant in the in the British Army, artillery person. Uh, and he has to muster out, but instead of going back to England, he said, I think I like China. He had been studying Chinese a little bit. And he found out that Sir Robert Hart, who most of you know as the Inspector General of the Imperial Maritime Customs Service, this is also part of the cooperative policy, the Westerners helping the Chinese, specifically the Qing Dynasty against the Taiping, and in this case, to collect customs. And so he finds out that there's an opening in the customs service. And so he gets hired by Hart as an assistant tide surveyor. And his first duty station is in Hanko. Uh, those of you who may know, Hanko is one of a tri-city uh, Nexus, which is uh, now called Wuhan. Uh, and he's going to end up there, by the way, at the end of his career. Uh, but that's where he's going to start in Hanko, uh, spend a year there. He's then going to go to Zhenjiang, which is uh, closer to Shanghai. And then finally in uh, Tianjin. And in the process, he's going to be promoted from assistant tide surveyor to tide surveyor. Uh, we have a photograph of the Tianjin foreign settlement where Lovett and some of the other uh, foreigners live. Now, when he's in Tianjin, interestingly enough, uh, Sir Robert Hart says, uh, instead of collecting customs duties, I want you to teach the Chinese uh, cavalry. Even though he's an artillery guy, they had Lovett teaching the, uh, the Qing troops uh, cavalry. And so from, and this is what he says when he's teaching these uh, the Chinese, these Manchus are a very tame, poor-spirited lot, nothing one would expect to find in the conquerors of such an empire. Well, so now he's fighting, uh, he's fought against the Taiping, but now he's going to fight against the Nian, the Nian Fei, the Nian bandits. Because when the Nian rebels threatened the Tianjin region, Brown and Lovett, Lu Fu is Lovett's name in Chinese. Uh, Lu is the ancient state of Lu, where uh, Confucius is from. Fu is prosperity, Fu Guo to Fu. Uh, so Lu Fu led the Wei Yuan cavalry to inspect all the strategic passes. They made nothing of hardships and guarded against the rebels day and night. And so the uh, superintendent of the three Norbert northern ports, Cheng Ho, sent this palace memorial, memorial to the emperor. Uh, and so Lovett was awarded what we call the yellow jacket. So the yellow jacket is uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it's not a, an, honor, it's an honorary uh, designation. Uh, so Lovett, who had mustered out as a sergeant, a gunnery sergeant, uh, from this point on, calls himself Colonel Lovett because he got this yellow jacket from the Chinese government. When Lovett had time off, he would sail down to Shanghai and he would stay at the Astor Hotel, the Astor House, which still stands here. Uh, this is it. I, I took this picture a couple of years ago. Uh, so he stayed in this hotel uh, run by British, British folks, and went to church there. He's an Anglican, got his picture taken in Shanghai. That's what he looked like. And while he was there, he ran into a missionary lady from the United States 
And uh, one day they're looking through, uh, she had been teaching high school uh, in a, right outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, in a place called Stillwater. And she had brought her senior class yearbook with her. And so they're looking through the yearbook, senior class yearbook. And the missionary shows, they come upon a picture of uh, this lady here. And if you've got great eyesight, uh, they start writing. And she wrote to him, ever your friend. Uh, so this is her picture. Uh, there it is up there in 1868. And so they started writing to each other, and uh, he decides that he's going to go and uh, ask her to marry him. And so in 1869, they get married in uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, and uh, they go on a honeymoon in Niagara Falls, and then he takes his new bride to Southampton to meet the folks. Uh, and so this picture is taken uh, after she got there, the newlywed, the bride, uh, to Southampton. Now, her folks wanted Lovett and her to come back and start a farm in Stillwater, Minnesota, but he couldn't stand the weather there. And we don't live that far away, so I can understand completely why it was too cold for him. And he still had his job in the Imperial Maritime Customs Service because Sir Robert Hart had given him a leave of absence to go to the United States and get married. So he took Jenny back uh, to China and before going back, he got his, he bought his. Uh, armor uh, when he was in, in England. By the way, I found this in a uh, pawn shop in uh, Minnesota. I guess this family had pawned it off in, <laughs> in, a, in a pawn shop in Minneapolis. Anyhow, he's sent back to China, and this time he's on Zhejiang. This is again on the Yangtze River. And he's there for quite a long time. And if you know the date 1870, you know that was the Tianjin massacre year. And so his, her folks back in Minnesota are worried, but here's what she writes to his, her folks. Do not let, the, let this late trouble in Tianjin alarm you. Will says we are more safe now than before. For the Chinese would not dare to engage in a war with all the foreign powers as they know their strength too well for that. Uh, so they didn't come home, they stayed in, in, uh, in Zhejiang. And so here's a picture of them in 1874 in Zhejiang. And by this time they have two children, uh, Helen and John. Uh, Helen is Nellie actually, Nellie. And in 1874, as you know, the Japanese invaded Taiwan. And because Lovett had a military background, Hart is going to say, we don't want you to collect customs anymore. We're going to send you to Taiwan to help the Chinese fight against the Japanese who have invaded Taiwan. And uh, the uh, so Sir Robert Hart is going to uh, order the commissioner at Zhou Zhang, that would be Lovett's superior. Lovett is a tide surveyor, who Kopsch is the uh, commissioner in Zhou Zhang. So Kopsch orders Lovett to go to Taiwan. And as a result, uh, Kopsch is arrested because uh, the British policy was that of neutrality. And yet here they are sending this guy to help the Chinese in their military exploits against the Japanese. So Consul King arrests Commissioner Kopsch and almost gets Lovett, except Lovett left the day before, before he could be jailed and arrested by uh, British Consul King in uh, Zhejiang. 
Here's what King wrote to Lovett. <laughs> I have reason to believe that your sudden departure yesterday was for the purpose of taking some part in the events resulting from the invasion of Taiwan by Japan. I'm advised by the minister, Minister Wade, caution you against taking part in operations. In other words, you go, got away by one day by avoiding arrest. And so if you look at the uh, customs in Taiwan, uh, you see uh, Europeans lately arrived in Taiwan Fu. In or for the Chinese service is Mr. H. N. Lovett of Zhujiang, Zhujiang Customs, a British subject who assists in engineering. He wasn't assisting in engineering. He's a military guy. He's going to give military assistance. Well, anyhow, just, uh, just as Lovett gets to Taiwan, uh, the, uh, the war ends and he doesn't take part in any military operations. But once again, this is part of the cooperative policy. He's aiding the Chinese, in this case, against the Japanese. So he comes back to Zhou Zhang, which is the customs house in the Bun, the Wai Tan uh, in Zhou Zhang. And um, throughout this book, you, you, know, you know, Lovett is a, he's an Anglican. And so he goes to church every Sunday. And uh, so he's got all sorts of things to say, mostly negative about missionaries. And here's one that he says, I pity the poor girl that marries the great baby. This is a missionary. <laughs> he's an awful lout and the greatest coward I ever met. And for a missionary to be awfully afraid of going to heaven with a well-directed stone from a heathen hand is something comical. <laughs> There was another incident. Uh, this is a missionary by the name of Tarbell. The mission had him up before them for being drunk and prayed with them, but all to no purpose because the doctor, Dr. Tarbell, being able to make longer and louder prayers than any of them. And then uh, the same Reverend Tarbell uh, telegraphed from Yokohama that Mrs. Tarbell must go home. Reverend Hart and his wife, this is not I.G. Hart, but a missionary. A missionary Hart and his wife believe that it was all made up of their part. I don't think Mrs. Tarbell was real sick when she was, she left here. In other words, this fellow, what Lovett's saying is, this guy came at the expense of the, uh, I think it was the Americans, uh, spent a year in China and decided he'd had enough and he wanted to go home. The only way he could get home was to pretend that his wife was sick and had to go back to the United States. So Lovett's very cynical about this. Now here's an interesting guy, German obviously, called George von Mollendorf in Chinese clothing. And Mollendorf and Lovett are really good friends. You're gonna hear about him in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to get into Sir Robert Hart a little bit more. Uh, Love had only met him like four or five times throughout his entire career, but at one time he came to Wuhu, which is where Love it was, right after he left Zhou Zhang. Uh, Robert, that's Sir Robert Hart, was very kind and talked away in a very happy, pleasant kind of way during dinner. He seemed very fond of making puns. I can hardly tell you how bad they were, but of course we laughed at the horrid things. When a fellow is inspector general, all understrappers are bound to laugh. <laughs> After woohoo, uh, he, gets, he gets a leave and he's going to go back home to England. And this is going to be for his last time. Well, his home is now Minnesota, actually. Uh, I have been long enough in England to like America a hundred times more than ever. I guess the American audiences would just see. Uh, after Wu Hu, he's uh, sent to back to Hanko, which is where he started out. Uh, here's another missionary story. After hearing a boring sermon by D.H., a British missionary, Lovett noted that none of the English parsons can preach as well as any ordinary American. I imagine they don't pay any attention to the art of public speaking. 
Uh, as for his own church, the Anglicans, my own church as a missionary church, I look upon as an utter failure and without any energy or zeal. Well, uh, he's then sent to Tianjin, and he's working in Tianjin collecting customs, but his friend Molendorf has been sent over to Korea to head up the customs service in Korea, which has just started. Because Molendorf and Lovett are good friends, he says to Lovett, why don't you come over here to Korea? Of course, you'd have to resign from the Chinese, but in service. But instead of being a tide surveyor, I'll make you a commissioner. It'll go from 200 yuan to 300 yen in terms of salary. Uh, we'll send you to Pusan, which is on the southeastern uh, coast, and you get a uh, you get a promotion, uh, a raise in salary. And so Lovett thinks about it for almost a year. By this time, by the way, Lovett can speak and understand Chinese. So after about a year, he says, okay, I'll accept my friend's office offer and I'll go over to Korea where I'll be the commissioner of customs in Busan. Commissioner now. But he gets mixed up with the debates within the Chinese court. Uh, there are people on the left-hand side of your screen there who are hardliners toward Korea. They include Sir Robert Hart, Yuan Shikai, and the Qing Liodong, the purest party. And these are the people who want to take over Korea, annex Korea. But the guy that's really in charge is Li Hongzhang. And Lee Hong Jong knows that if, oh, if we take over, if we take over what these people want to do and exit, uh, there'll be hell to pay. Uh, we can control them indirectly. We can send somebody like Yuan Shikai over to kind of boss the Koreans around. And so the most important guy in the Korean government turns out not to be the king of Korea <laughs> in Kojong, but rather the Chinese resident. He can't call himself ambassador because that would put them on the same level as the other ambassadors. So he calls himself resident uh, so he can boss the Korean government around. There's another picture of Ho Jong. And so Lee Hong Jong uh, is going to control Korea indirectly, indirectly. Uh, Molendorf by this time is in Korea and now he's dressed in Korean costume and his office of course is in Seoul, the capital. Uh, so he's Lovett's boss, if you will, uh, head of the customs, the Korean customs, the, the Haeguan, as they say in Korean. And Lovett is one of three commissioners. He's in Lovett's in Busan. And, uh, oops. So you can see that uh, here's the Korean Customs Office in Seoul, Molendorf's office. Here's the American legation here. Here's the British legation here. Uh, here's a picture that uh, Lovett took of uh, Nam Ding Wun means uh, South Big Gate. Some crazy guy tried to burn this down, you know, about. And years ago, I don't know if you read about that. Uh, it's national treasure number one. They didn't have anybody guarding the thing, so this crazy guy got up, and that's wooden up there. Burned it, burned it down. And they've got things on. Uh, by this time, uh, Nellie or Jenny is back in Minnesota. They've got four kids now, and. Um, I'm going to point out to you, uh, here's Nellie, uh, here's Ida, uh, here's John, and Mabel. And Mabel's going to come to Busan because she's uh, like kindergarten age. The other three stay back in Minnesota and are going to school. Uh, so Busan is mostly a Japanese city by this time. You see the uh, the Japanese flag and post office. 
and you see three Japanese guy and one Korean guy, the Korean guys in white and the three Japanese wearing Western suits in dark standing next to him. And um, so this is, this is Busan and Lovitz working here at the uh, Busan uh, customs office. Uh, the uh, main street is Bentendori, and Lovett lives on uh, on Machidori downtown street. Here's a here's the customs off house. That's where Lovett lives, so he can walk about a couple hundred yards to get to work. Now here's the Japanese consulate. Halfway up the mountain, you can see the see the Japanese houses here. Uh, here's some of the sources that I use. If you see up here, this is uh, is Korean Majesty's Customs, and uh, Lovett has crossed off Renchuan, which is Incheon, and written in Fusan, which is the Japanese pronunciation of Fusan. So he's writing a letter to his daughter. That's one of the sources. And here's Yuan Shikai, who Yuan Liang Zhang is put in, sent to Korea to boss the Koreans around without having to annex Korea. Well, it turns out that Mollendorf says, I'm sick of the Chinese pushing the Koreans around. I'm going to see if the Russians won't be Korea's big brother. Leon Zhang finds out about it and says, you traitor, I, I sent you there just to start up a custom service and now you're stabbing us in the back. So I'm gonna tell the Korean foreign minister, Kim Yun-shik, uh, to fire Mollendorf. Mollendorf is fired at the behest of Leon Zhang and he's replaced by Henry Merle, and this is his Harvard graduation picture, obviously an American. And before he leaves China to go to Korea, he's working for Sir Robert Hart. Hart calls him in and says, uh, I'm gonna send you over to Korea to take Mollendorf's place as head of the Korean customs, but I'm gonna take over. I'm gonna annex the Korean customs service, but you can't tell anyone. And you can't tell Lee Hong John. That's my plan. And the only person that knows that Lee Hong Jong is gonna take over the Korean Customs Service is Hart, Merrill, and a guy named Hunt, it's on your sheet that you got, uh, who is Hart's, uh, Henry, Mer Henry Merrill's assistant. And what Hart says to Merrill, you've got to fire all three of those commissioners. Love it and the other two, because there are three treaty ports. Hart tells Merrill to publish Korea's returns and the Chinese returns. This will be the best way of gradually accustoming people in various directions to the union we have in view. In other words, we're going to we're going to annex the Korean custom. Hart then tells Merrill to fire all three commissioners, including Lovin. And at, there, at this time, Jenny, who had come to Busan to be with her husband, uh, she got pregnant. So she returns to Minnesota in 1885 uh, to give birth to their fifth and final child. And you'll see him a little bit later. This is uh, Willie Lovett, who got who was born in Minnesota after they left, she left Minnesota. Well, Merrill goes around and he's, he wants to have this Korean Customs Service run efficiently. He says to Hart, with the exception of Mr. Lovett, the three commissioners do not appear to have administered their offices satisfactorily. In other words, Sir Robert Hart, Lovett shouldn't be fired. He's a good commissioner. Here's what Hart writes back. Lovett is a very decent fellow, but he's not the stamp of a man who had charge of a port. An excellent types are great, but that's all. Lovett never knew that Hart thought this. 
because this is only between Art and Merle. And continue to hope that if he were ever to go back to China, he'd be promoted. Merle sends Hunt, his assistant, down to Busan to show Love it how the, the new system's working because there's a new commissioner, that's Merrill. And Love it peppers Hunt with questions and finally Hunt spills the beans. My boss, Merrill, in, in time the whole Korean service will go into the hands of Sir Robert. And there's no doubt that the present men, meaning you, <laughs> will be got rid of. We Mullendorfians may be ordered to quit, bag and Luggage at any day, sayonara. I'm not going to surrender my position without pretty generous treatment. In other words, Lovett's in on the secret. Lovett knows that Hart's going to take over the Korean Customs Service. So he's going to play his cards very well. Uh, Merrill writes back to Hart, from a strictly business point of view, it's right to fire these people. But if they know that you're going to fire an excess service, they would probably expect no other fate. But I cannot tell them that. It's a secret. My aim is to get done with the present commissioners at once without making any trouble. My aim is to get each man to resign quietly. So when they, he says to, Merrill says, you've got to resign. Here, Lovett says, I want a lot of money. And he was initially offered 3,500. That's a lot of money in 1886. A long paid leave of absence, a letter of recommendation before sending, tendering his resignation, re-employment in the Chinese Customs Service per, at the rank of commissioner, and resignation rather than outright dismissal. And Lovett says, okay, you're offering me 3,500? That's not enough. So Merle says, okay, I'll give you 4,500 if you resign. Lovett says, that's still not enough. I've got an idea. Why don't we have some outside observer decide what my severance pay should be? Someone like, oh, I don't know, Sir Robert Hart. <laughs> and so obviously Merle knows that Hart's in on the secret, or that Lovett's in on the secret. I could not place you, Hart, in the position of arbitrating in a matter in which you were officially interested, nor yet could I give any hint that you were so interested. <laughs> Lovett's reference to you was his way of discovering how much you had to do with the Conaway. In other words, he knows that, Lovett knows that Hart's behind his firing and he's gonna take over the Korean customs. So, what? Hards does love and have to play. If you don't give me more money, more than the 4,500 you're now offering me, I'll go public by complaining to the Western reps in Seoul, such as the American George Falk, or I'll go public to by complaining to the anti-Chinese faction in the Korean government. And Merrill says, oh my God, he knows, Lovett knows the secret. Suppose the worst should happen to Lovett by reading raising the cry of Chinese interference and arousing the anti-Chinese element and possibly some of the foreign reps should succeed in obtaining the issue of instruction from the Korean government for me to continue them. And well, what am I going to do? Here's George Folk and his Japanese wife. Well, Lovett has played his cards right. He says, okay, uh, will you go if I give you $6,000? So, Lovett gets $6,000, that's a lot of money in 1886. He gets a year and a half paid leave of absence, half pay. He gets a letter of recommendation and he gets to read it before he tenders his resignation. I mean, how, how often can you do that? <laughs> he gets offered employment in the Chinese Customs Service, but Hart says, well, if you come back, we'll, we'll give you a job, but you only get 1,500, so you choose. Unemployment in 6,000, or employment in, back in China and get 1,500. Lovett's gonna choose 6,000. And he gets to resign rather than being 
dismissed. Uh, so uh, Lovett goes back to Minnesota. He can't stand the weather. He has some financial reverses. And so he writes back to Merle, who writes back to Hart, says, can't you do something for Lovett? And so Lovett is, in fact, rehired by Hart, but he's rehired in China as an assistant tire surveyor. That's where he started out, if you remember. Uh, and he's sent to Fuzhou. Here's what Lovett said. The position in pay seems almost an insult, but you know Sir Robert Hart is very bitter, and he evidently intends I shall eat humble pie and be a warning to other members of the service. He's already angry at Hart because he knows that Hart got him fired from his commissioner position in Korea. All right, so um, bringing this to a close, he's going back to China, Fuzhou as an assistant tide surveyor. He's got some interesting things to say. Uh, a lot of things in this book. Uh, he's talking about beggars. The bridge is crowded with chiling bookshops, hucksters, and beggars. The latter appear to divide the bridge into equal portions. And each one of them begs you from a certain distance. Then he drops you when you are immediately importuned by a fresh one. Strange to say, many of the beggars speak very good Mandarin. They don't speak Mandarin, Utonghua, and Fujian province. Uh, evidently, they are men of travel and experience. They all possess a good deal of philosophy, for they take the many rebuffs they meet with very, very calmly and grim pleasure. So here's what Love it looks like. He's now in his 50s. Uh, here's a picnic party in Fujo. Uh, Love it standing on the left with some of the other people in the customs in Fuzhou. And now he's back in Zhejiang from 1889 to 90. Uh, he's collecting customs. I'm sitting here in the offices surrounded by Chinese, some kneeling, some very sorrowful, others indifferent, but all desirous of wheeling out of me the things seized on board the steamer. I do give back a good many, in fact, nearly all, so that some of the foreign officers feel a little sore over it. Still, the Chinaman has the right to his name. Uh, the Yangtze River flooded a lot. And so here they are getting on the boat uh, via a plank. Uh, let's see. Well, it's one of those. Let's see, do I show where he is? Uh, here's a love it seated second from the right. In the Yangtze River flooding in Zhejiang. Uh, here's the local Dao Tai. Uh, he's uh, showing up. Lovett's office is here. Um, this is, of course, the Zhejiang Bund session in Zhejiang. Got a lot of pictures of Zhejiang. If you've ever been north of Zhejiang, the mountains are up there. It's a lot cooler up there. The Lushan, uh, Lushan is up there. Uh, there's Lovett standing with his umbrella on the left-hand side. Uh, here's uh, the commissioner's wife, mountains above Joe Jung. That's her again. There's Lovett seated with uh, Mrs. Uh, de Bernier's and daughter at the pool above Joe Jung. Here's the Lu Shan, oh, uh, Huang Yong. <laughs> Lushan, Yellow Dragon Pool. Uh, all the foreign embassies have uh, summer houses up there. So here's one of the bungalows. Uh, here's another bungalow. Here's the Russian bungalow. Uh, there's Lovett standing on the left. Uh, here's another view of the Russian bungalow. Uh, here they're having a party, New Year's Eve party. Um, there's Lovett standing there. This is the this is the commissioner Bernier's. Uh, these are some Russian Russian officers. Uh, there's Lovett. Lovett's uh, partially uh, obscured in the back here of this party. Here he is uh, playing lawn tennis in Zhejiang. Here they are walking on the Bund. 
for the steamer in Zhejiang. Uh, here they are, they're gonna be uh, drinking champagne. Uh, here's Love It Here, and they're toasting. Here's the, uh, here's the commissioner over here. There's Love It standing on the left. Uh, Love It standing on the left, still in Zhejiang. Here are the customs housing here. Love It's house in Zhejiang. Uh, here's Love It here with some of the yeah. customs here. Here he is. Uh, one, two, here's Love It standing on the uh, ship. Uh, he's going to open up the uh, port of Treaty Port of Chongjing, Chongqing, as he was saying. And he's going to be joined by his wife because <coughs> Mabel died of scarlet fever. And so she's buried in the cemetery and uh, inside of uh, St. Paul. So, and the other kids are old enough that they're going off to college. Uh, so, Lovett, who's been a bachelor for most of this time, is now going to be joined by his wife, Jenny. Here they are standing in front of their house in Ijon. And you can see four servants of theirs standing in the background. Uh, here's the Ijon Customs, where Lovett works. Here are the Ijang Customs. Um, here's Lovett here. Uh, here's Jenny here. Uh, Willie, remember Willie? Uh, and he went back to, got pregnant in Busan, so went back. Here he is, he's about 10 years old. Picture was taken in Shanghai. Uh, there's Love It, and this is Jenny here. Willie is in front of her. That would be right here. Willie. Uh, here's Willie again, growing older. Uh, here's Jenny. She's on the chair here. Here's Love it, raising his hat, doffing his hat, and here's Willie in the front. Uh, Willie went to an Anglican school in uh, Jefu, and here he is right here. Okay. So this is a British, this is going to be the British section. There's an American section and the British section. Love it, family. Here are grown up kids. Here's, here he is standing in front of the customs house in Canton, Guangzhou. Uh, Willie here riding a bike in Canton. Here's Willie again. And here he is back in Zhou Zhang. And Ida is going to join him. That's his daughter. Uh, Ida had just graduated from the University of California, Berkeley. And so she's coming back to join her parents in. Uh, Joe Jung. Uh, here's Love It. Here's Ida. And uh, Jenny. Okay, this is the end of the of his story. He's in Hanko. These are the last uh, still photographs of uh, Jenny and William Nelson. Here's the Hanko Bund. The day at the races. Uh, every day, ha Lovett walked around the racetrack. That was his exercise. He was an inventor. And if you know Wuhan, you know. Wuhan is one of the four furnaces of China. You know that, right? 
meaning it's very, very hot. Here's Lovett, he's doffing his hat here in the back. The Canteries, uh, standing there on the customs boat. Uh, here's the customs house decked out for the coronation of King Edward VII. Uh, Lovett's front and center. He's a tide surveyor and harbor master. He's never been promoted. He doesn't know it, but he'll never be promoted because you know what Hart, you know what Hart wrote about him. Uh, here's his living room in Han Ko. Uh, he's having some Chinese dignitaries over for dinner. Uh, he's throwing a big party. Uh, love it, one, two, three, four, five, love it is there. Any third from right there or something. Uh, Ida's there with them, her daughter, their daughter, and uh, they're building the railroad from Wuhan to Beijing. Here's one of the tunnels. And one of the workers there is this guy, French guy, Frenchy as they called him, Jean de Carbonel. Here he is Jean de Carbonel voting in Han Ko. And Jean de Carbonel proposes to Ida and they get married. You are coming out of the house, father and daughter. And here is the wedding. This is still on Hanko. Uh, here's Ida and Jean here. And here's, here's Jenny and William Nelson back here. And here are the wedding gifts. And Ida so now. William Nelson and any of your grandparents. And it's very, a very deep regret that we have to announce the untimely death at Han Ko of William Nelson Lovett, Hyde Surveyor and Harbor Master there, although the weather was unusually hot. Mr. Lovett went for his usual walk around the race course, came back, was stricken with heat apoplexy and died. At the river ports and at every port in China where he was known, the greatest sorrow at his loss and the deepest sympathy with his family and widow will be felt. That's in the North China. All right, just the end. Uh, Willie ends up going to school here in England. Uh, here's Jean Michael de Carvanel. Uh, after William Nelson Lovett dies, uh, then he comes back to Minnesota. The caption here is incorrect, but that's, that's Jenny there. Uh, and Jenny is going to die in 1911, which is the same year that Sir Robert Hart dies and the same year that the Qing Dynasty uh, falls. Buried in. You're probably asking, well, where is, where is William Nelson Lovett buried? Uh, he was bought, he was buried in the foreigner's cemetery in Hanko, now Wuhan, of course. But when the Chinese communists took over in 1949, they uh, dug it up and put the number four hospital where the foreigner cemetery used to be. So grave is nowhere to be found. Uh, Michael de Carbonell died of food poisoning in 1913. So he's buried in the French cemetery in Shanghai. So they had a family reunion in 1914. Uh, Ida and Jenny, uh, no, not Jenny, Jenny's dead. Uh, and Ida came back to right outside of Stillwater. And Willie is there. And um, just one final note, uh, his son, he got married, and his son is named Michael Lovett. I don't know how many of you know of uh, Kirk, Captain Morgan. It's a rum, Captain Morgan. Well, before Captain Morgan, there was Admiral Nelson, which was also a rum. You, still, you can still buy it. And his son, Michael Lovett, they wanted somebody to be on the, you know, on the, on the label. They wanted someone who was a naval person and who was related to Admiral Nelson. 
and they came up with Michael Lovett, whose grandfather was William Nelson Lovett. And so they dressed him up with one of those, you know, those pirate things with the frilly thing with the white frilly short down to his belly button and uh, had a, one of these periscopes and that sort of thing in the, in the spy you know, crow's nest. Uh, so if you get an old bottle of Colonel or uh, Admiral Nelson's rum, that's his son on the interesting but useless information, right? Uh, on the, uh, I think this is our last one. Um, we had a Lovett family reunion on the, on the 100th anniversary of his death. Uh, remember the there's a there's a part of the Lovett family, uh, Michael Lovett, for they uh, ended up uh, well they ended up here in England, but for many years they lived in uh, Andorra. Uh, the lady who told me about it's this lady right here, the lady from Nevada uh, that I met in Beijing in nine, 1980, uh, decarbonal. Decarbonal and decarbonal, though. So that's Ida's, Ida's uh, children. Okay, and this is me here. And so, and this is the uh, one of the awards that Lovett got for his service in the customs service. Um, and these are other Lovett descendants uh, of various stripes. Uh, can't say I know all of them. Except for me and her. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I would happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Right, so uh, thank you very much. I read the book and I did a review, but today you certainly with so many pictures, you definitely sh show me different sides of a uh, love story. Um, anyone have questions? I do have one or two, but uh, open the floor, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking, asking it. Um, I'm going to ask you to answer the a very interesting account of Leibens, Le Leibensville, yes. Um, but I just wonder how you've got access to the art Merrill response. The Merrill papers are in the Houghton Library at Harvard University. It's very rich. Oh, yeah. Uh, and of course, as uh, Wei Pin knows, I've gone through the art papers at, in, at the Queen's University. Uh, so you're almost undecipherable if you've ever had a look at them. Um, so the yeah the Merle papers are yeah, at the Harvard, uh, and it turned out I was at Harvard, so it was I was able to get them. Uh, yeah, the there isn't much. The the book that Mrs. Mollendorf uh, wrote was of course in German, uh, and it says well they. Uh, he played the piano and the, they went to the church service and uh, Mollendorf played the piano and uh, they were good friends, but you don't hear much else uh, about it. Uh, most of the, uh, so, you know, some of it comes from the, the, uh, well, the Chinese sources, you know, you, you find out about uh, the, uh, Mollendorf, uh, Lovett getting the yellow jacket, for example. Um, I guess that's a little bit before Mollendorf. But, uh, yeah, not that there wasn't that much in the Mrs. L what was her name? I forgot her name, but yeah, oh. I, Mrs. Mollendorf. But thank you for your question. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Well, I was just looking at all the places he, he, he was in China for about 40 years. Oh, art? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, he was. No, no. He was in China for 40 years, 40 with, years. with the exception of those uh, two or three years in, in Korea. Yes. And then, but then, you know, because when you read the book, you, you learn a lot about art. And at some point, Lovett hates art because Lovett got him fired from his commissionership in Korea. He was, he was in on the secret because he got the Merle's assistant to spill the beans. And he liked his job in Busan. You know? uh, so he goes back uh, in the book, uh, he was boiling mad when he pulled into Nagasaki on his way back to, to America. But then, so he spends about a year, but he's still on, uh, but he's, he's on half salary for a year and a half, right? The, he, he drove a hard bargain. And if you think about it, can't prove it, but why didn't Korea get annexed by China? Why didn't the customs service? Because Hart and Merle now, the, the secret is out. And and you know Lee Hyung Jong is going to find out that uh, Hart is going to try to annex the Korean customs, and so now now that the secret's out, because Lovett knows, we better give Lovett everything he wants, let him go quietly, but we can't go ahead and annex the Korean customs service because uh, the the beans have been spilled. So he goes back to Minnesota. He's back there for a year and a half. He's he's on half salary, but it's the, the climate. The climate uh, hasn't changed. He doesn't want to be a farmer, and so he asked to be taken back to into the custom service in China. And you know, and love it admits. Look, you know, Hart didn't have to take it, take me back, and he did. And uh, but he took me back as an assistant tide surveyor. Uh, but I'll show him how good of an assistant tide surveyor I am, and maybe I'll get promoted to tide surveyor, which he did. So he made it back up to tide surveyor, but he never made it to commissioner and because he never knew what Hart really thought about him. And what was it? He's a good stamp of a man, but not stamp of a man to be in charge of the port. Lovett never knew that, of course. And Lovett had passed all the Chinese exams. I mean, he, he, could, he could speak Chinese. And that's, that's how you moved up. Of course, other people said, the way, the way people move up in the Chinese Imperial Customs Service is you have a pretty wife with, a, with musical uh, attributes so they can or play the violin or the piano or something like that, which Sir Robert seemed to like. And uh, so there's all sorts of things in there. Can I ask a couple of questions, uh, Wayne? Uh, I think you really, for, for me, there are a lot of writings, journals left by customs commissioners, hmm. but quite, and there are the spatial group commissioners. So, and uh, whereas for Price the bears and harbor monsters for, for, for people who are being interested in Chinese maritime custom service history, we found very little mm. record written by uh, people like Price the Bear and uh, Harbor Masters. So I think it's quite important you share the light, right. uh, bring the, the nugget into our horizon. That's great. Um, so my, my two questions are first one, you I remember in, I remember in your book you said that. In the in 1875, 76, when uh, Wade, the British uh, minister in Beijing, had a kind of big argument with Chinese government, mm. and there were a lot of rumors about uh, Britain might have war with China in, a, in that time. And uh, Lovett and other British uh, people in the foreign communities. They were, including lovers, they were hoping there would be a war mm -hmm. because they felt Britain had been too soft mm -hmm. on China. China deserves some kind of um, 
less than from like mildly light, uh, less than from from, from England. Yeah. Lesson, yeah. yeah. So I just wonder if, but as the time move on, how 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 did the love perspective, his attitude toward China changed? But uh, by the because we talk about 1876, when the time he died, do you sense from his letters, his writing, do you sense that kind of journey within himself internally about his perspective about, about China? That's my first question. My second question is, um, did you, can, can you tell us more about if we wanted to find records about the kind of job work done by Harbour Masters or where can we go to find this kind of record? Because they are relatively difficult to find. So do you have any idea for that? Uh, well, let me let me answer the second question first. Um, the way I got the papers in the first place was really serendipitous, uh, kind of put in my lap, if you will. It was lucky. Um, I looked through the, you know, the DR Leisure Dong on Guan in, in uh, uh, Nanjing. And I was hoping there might be some other things in it. I couldn't find anything. And then I heard rumors that Mr. Ma, who's in charge, yeah. <laughs> you know, Mr. Ma, yeah. uh, was keeping some things back so he could oh. do it. So we don't know if we've seen everything, maybe at the number two uh, in Nanjing. Uh, I guess that's what I would look and maybe I would ask Mr. Ma to let us see everything. Um, but back to your original question. Um, yeah, there are some, there are some times when Lovett says, you know, we, we should really teach these Chinese people, you know, they, you know, they, they drag their feet, they only give in at the last minute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you don't hear much about that after, uh, I guess it's the Ely uh, River uh, crisis of 1880. The, um, he get, starts to get more worried about the uh, anti-foreignism against, and so, uh, it's funny because he says the Chinese officials, a lot of them are corrupt. Uh, and then you've got people coming up the upriver from Hunan <laughs> who uh, are anti-foreign and they're burning, they're killing these people and burning this missionary uh, housing and that sort of thing. Uh, so they, his, his focus switches from the government per se, he kind of comes to the conclusion, well, these officials are corrupt, um, but we have to uh, protect the foreign community. And so we need these, we need these ships to come in to show the flag. And, um, and luckily, you know, when the opium or the, you know, the Fox of Rebellion, uh, luckily, he's on leave at that time, so he doesn't get caught up in that so much. So, yeah, he's he's a a pretty hardline guy, but then over time, he's more concerned about anti -form. Yeah, and also, I feel actually. Despite all a lot of uh, social events, photo show us in the book, you actually describe the kind of solitude mm. uh, of lovers, night after night. You know, after supper, you know, quietly see his living room, reading book, practice Chinese. You know, have a drink, that kind of thing. Kind of, a lot of kind of solitude moment, quite a lot, kind of reflective. Well, right, because his family's back in yeah, Minnesota. Exactly. So he shared different lives mm -hmm. beyond those that kind of very busy social social life engagements. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he also constantly worry about money, you know, shortage of money, you know. So he showed you, I think your book really vividly showed the different aspects of uh, the foreign people working in China at that time. 
Uh, uh, the, underneath the surface. Yeah. He makes fun. Speaking of that, uh, there's a. He makes fun of the French uh, consul in uh, Zhou Zhang, and it says, "Oh, I'm so afraid." Well, he's French consul doesn't speak a word of Chinese, <laughs> and Levin says, "There's no anti-foreignism here, but he's sending off these." Cables to the French. Oh, send warships. Uh, it's going to be trouble. And it says, oh, you don't know anything about what. Um, any more questions from the audience? So, if not, should we thank Wayne together? Thank you very much.